Hi, this is Kevin Swiger with DPG Micromeasurements. I'd like to thank everyone today for joining us for our webinar on printed circuit board assemblies and how to install strain gauges. Today with us on the webinar, we have Jim Johnson, Tom Rummage, Daryl Peterson, and myself. And collectively, we have over 100 years of strain gauge experience in the, in the room today. Daryl? So I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, Daryl Peterson, I'm the Applications Engineering Manager. Uh, been with the company uh, 24 years. And about the time that I started was about the time that we started seeing customers use strain gauges for applications that were a little bit different than historical reasons, like testing large pieces of equipment or structures. We found that customers started using gauges on these little printed circuit board assemblies for a variety of reasons. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what some of those reasons are and how you'd go about doing it. This is Tom Rummage. Uh, one of the driving forces is the advent of surface mount components. Uh, with the advent of sur surface mount components, the stresses of bending the board and or installing it and dropping it go up on those surface mount components. And so uh, the strain gauges have been uh, applied next to or on those components to determine how that uh, the operations of making the board and inserting it into the piece of equipment, how that affects the ball grid arrays and the capacitors and the resistors that are on those circuit boards. And I've been playing with strain gauges nigh on to 42 years. I'm the old guy here. Thanks, Tom. Jim Johnson here. Uh, I have a little over 37 years of experience in strain measurement. And as Tom alluded to, the, the driving force for starting to test printed circuit board assemblies was the move from through-hole components to surface mount. This was uh, further uh, aggravated by the switch from leaded to lead-free solder. Lead-free solder is very susceptible to brittle fractures. And so assembly loads, shock and drop loads, in-service loads are, are causing component failures and component to PCB board interface failures due to these brittle fractures of lead-free solder. And so we've gone from seeing very limited testing of surface mount components and printed circuit boards 12 to 15 years ago to now where it's a very large part of the industry demand, not only for conventional strain gauges, but for stacked rosettes, very, very small, planar style rosette gauges, and higher and higher speed data acquisition. As a matter of fact, we uh, uh, took it on ourselves to design a specific pattern, the, the uh, G1350, which is a stacked rosette with uh, grids nominally about 40 thousandths of an inch active grid, to get close to the edge of those ball grid arrays so that we can uh, present both direction and magnitude strain data to the uh, test engineers and or those people who are evaluating those components. Yeah, that, that G1350 design is a very small footprint. It's a five millimeter diameter matrix, and it allows placement of those grids close to the corner uh, ball in the ball grid array. And then we further uh, developed an ultra miniature planar rosette for similar types of application. And, and so that really <clears throat> ties into this first slide, um, the IPC 9704. Um, this was a, um, if you roll back, it's been about 15 years ago, uh, there was a committee put together uh, being driven mainly by Sun Microsystems to take companies that are, were involved with the production of these components and a large part supplied by Intel where they were taking these components instead of through hole they became surface mount and they were finding they were having uh, failures, not so much in the field, but in production. So they were really, the, the driver here was to try to standardize a test method for how to determine how much strain is too much strain on one of these boards that could lead to failures even or either in the production line or latent failures that would come after the product uh, had been released. Uh, this goes back to about 2003, 2004, uh, where we were meeting with Sun Microsystems on a pretty frequent basis along with having uh, phone conversations to try to establish you know these parameters to give customers guidelines behind how to approach this test and the standard <clears throat> I think instead of calling it a standard they call it a guideline but that was published 
the original one in June of 2005. Part of that standard was something to do with the instrumentation also, the number of samples per second. Uh, when, in this kind of testing, they wanted to be sure and capture the event. So they're looking at somewhere between 500 and 2,000 samples per second in the instrumentation package that uh, works with this. And our system 7000 was designed basically around this specification. And yeah, we found <clears throat> before this time that customers were using uh, traditional uh, WK and WA series stacked rosettes and there's quite a bit of labor involved in the wiring of those and out of these meetings came much more emphasis on creating strain gauges for this test ones that have pre-attached cables to make it easier for customers to run the type of testing that you would do to qualify these boards. And beyond the uh, the standard gauges that we, we offered with pre-attached cables, we also <laughs> found that many customers were driving us toward customizing those stacked rosettes with various cable types to allow for routing of that cable outside of various packaging, especially when we're talking about small handheld devices um, there may be uh, long lengths of a fine wire uh, to facilitate the routing of that cabling from the instrument into the, the strain gauge. Later on, they started looking more at uh, the drop test where the frequency response of the strain gauge and also the instrumentation packages used to evaluate them went up significantly. Uh, in the drop test, uh, they, they're looking at uh, 20 kilohertz uh, scan rates rather than down in the 500 to 2,000, and in this case, this would uh, lend itself toward our system 9,000 that samples at 50,000 samples per second. And then rather than making the conventional measurements that we were used to in normal mechanical engineering applications of max and min principle strain and direction, they became more interested in, in strain rate as opposed to actual strain levels because they found that component damage was much more a function of how fast the strain was applied as opposed to the ultimate strain that they might achieve in a, in a bend test or, or an assembly test. And they also are looking at diagonal strains, which are kind of particular to PCB test uh, considerations as opposed to, again, the more conventional mechanical engineering measurements. If you go back to the <clears throat> late 90s, uh, there was a young engineer, his name was Mike Mello, that attended one of our strain gauge workshops and we had introduced him to the system 6000 uh, which he took that system and used it to start characterizing when the solder balls would fail under what type of uh, board level deflection so basically what Mike did was create a continuous circuit of all these solder balls and look at when it went open versus the amount of strain displacement that he would measure on the board. And out of that work, I think, was really the, the origin of some of these other standards, such as the, the JESD22B113. Um, Mike Mello really kind of established some of that very early testing of the behavior of these solder balls relative to the strain on the board. That kind of strain was more related to the depaneling of the boards and or the insertion into the final component, the bed of nails testing when it all bends and flexes and that sort of thing. Uh, that was part of what drove this also. So really an overview for uh, strain gauge testing of printed circuit boards we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the gauge types, uh, typical locations, uh, issues to think about, such as uh, how you route the lead wires out of an in-circuit tester, uh, some of the typical test processes and sample rates, uh, a little bit about expected strain levels and when are they too much, and also a little bit about strain rates and how that stuff really ties together. The gauge types, they basically, the they drove the beginning of the C2A series of strain gauges. They have the small enameled wire between the gauge and the uh, uh, transitioning to a 26 gauge piece of wire. And uh, we further have modified that. We have an option 
that allows us to uh, add 20 inches of that enameled wire so that routing it off the circuit board and through the, uh, the fixturing uh, tends to be a little bit easier. That's a, a standard option that we offer with the C2A series of gauges. This is um, basically a slide that shows kind of the process involved in testing these printed circuit boards in the different areas uh, that may be part of where you might want to strain gauge. Uh, whether it's like the first in-circuit test function or maybe you're adding a component onto the board for board assembly or then a secondary in-circuit test function. Uh, there's multiple places in the manufacturing of that board where strain gauges may be uh, vital to help you uh, determine if you've got some excess, excessive strains either due to the in-circuit test or due to functional test or due to depaneling of the board or even in the, the shipping uh, of the component once it's done. And this was a slide that was pulled straight from IPC 9704 to kind of illustrate all the different areas that might be critical for you uh, to test. One of the steps that you didn't mention, Daryl, and certainly more challenging tests is monitoring strains on the board during solder reflow, the elevated temperature, and the fact that the, the board is, is passing through a conveyorized oven increases the challenge and changes the gauge selection and adhesives to a, to a higher temperature version. And we can certainly help support the customer if that becomes an important part of their test program. Uh, suffice it to say we have the materials and the products necessary to do that, but it's a much more challenging uh, proposition than doing a room temperature test. So some of the, the uh, terminology <clears throat> associated with this type of testing, uh, if you're watching this presentation, chances are you know a lot of this already. Uh, but PCB is the printed circuit board itself. Uh, PCBA is the printed circuit board assembly, meaning it's, now it's got uh, the components that are attached. Uh, SMT is the surface mount technology. That's really the thing that's been driving over the past 20 years, the introduction of strain gauges to this type of application. Uh, area array component, that's the uh, ball grid array. That's the solder balls underneath the chip. Uh, non-area array component uh, terminations around the edge um, and then the last is the vias which would be the small holes that carry the conductors through the layers of the printed circuit board. We're looking at the C2A series of gauges in this particular slide. The O15LW is a very very small uh, grid length and it can be purchased in either 120 or 350 ohm uh, versions. 350 ohm is generally preferred because of the grid self-heating issues because printed circuit boards are not terribly good heat sinks. So having the higher resistance on that smaller gauge allows you to run a, a little bit higher excitation without having problems with stability. Uh, this is also showing that option SP20, which is the 20 inches or 500 millimeters of the 34 gauge wire allowing it to be more convenient for routing the wire off of the circuit board testing. A common application for a gauge like this would be if you had a surface mount capacitor on a board that you were finding that you were having problems with it. Uh, you could put this gauge on the board right next to that capacitor and then take it through the different production steps and establish what the strain on the board is at that location where the capacitor is located can also, if you desire, you could actually mount this gauge onto the capacitor itself to monitor the strains that are occurring there to get real-time data on the stresses in that particular component. This is another version, uh, 350 ohm, uh, small size uniaxial gauge that basically uh, can be used for the same purpose, but you'll notice that it's rated to quite a bit higher temperature. It's rated up to 200 degrees Celsius. So sort of like Jim was mentioning earlier when uh, the part may see some elevated temperatures during like a reflow process, uh, you might consider using these because they are rated 
uh, to 200 degrees Celsius. I might also just interject there that uh, this is a relatively new offering from MicroMeasurements using our advanced sensors technology. You'll also note that this is uh, pre-leaded with a three conductor setup for a three wire quarter bridge clear to the strain gauge to eliminate the thermal effects on the resistance of the lead wire and when you're going through a reflow oven the dramatic temperature change uh, will result in an undesirable output due to the resistance change in the lead wire and using the three wire quarter bridge and making that connection right at the strain gauge cancels the thermal effects on the lead wires. They're also Teflon insulated and we use a solder that's capable of handling the 200 degrees C. Uh, the normal vinyl insulated that you typically associate with this wouldn't survive that temperature. This is the three element stack rosette I think Jim had mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a G1350 and it has a circular trim diameter just over uh, five millimeters. This gauge, you can also get it in a 120 or 350 ohm resistance. Uh, it has an active gauge length of one millimeter for the three grids. Uh, it's also a C2A construction, which means it's pre-cabled. And it also has the SP20 option, and that's the 20 inches of the fine enamel insulated wire. And it's really useful if you're running an in-circuit test to be able to get the wires out over that ceiling edge around the in-circuit tester and that's really the driver behind the 20 inches is to allow you to be able to put the gauge on the board, route some fine leads through the board around components and then get out over the edge of the seal for the in-circuit tester. And then you've got 10 feet of conductor to, to get back over to your electronics. The circular trim on that particular gauge also makes it convenient to get it up close to the edge of ball grid arrays and that sort of thing. Uh, and the design of the gauge, the laminated uh, polyamide construction is very flexible uh, and lends itself to ease of application. You're not so worried about damaging the gauge because it's fully encapsulated. The S5198 is a planar version of a three element rectangular rosette and in some cases it's much more desirable to have the three gauges on a single plane. It certainly helps with dissipation of heat that builds up as a result of the current going through the gauge rather than having to dissipate that heat through those multiple layers of a stacked rosette. The very small footprint on this gauge also lends itself for placement near a component and in, in both the case of, of the planar type and the G1350, the footprint's minimized so that depopulating of the board is either limited or eliminated altogether because removing components, of course, changes the strain path and the strain gradients on the component. So the goal is to avoid influencing the result by uh, component removal. And one of the things we haven't mentioned uh, is the, the driver behind using a three element rosette is it allows you to solve for principal strains and direction. So a three element rosette will give you the most information you can get out of a strain gauge measurement. So if you're not sure of what the primary direction is that's changing, a three element rosette allows you to solve for that. You take three measurements at fixed angles and allows you to calculate your unknowns, which are your maximum and minimum principal strain and direction. That direction is referenced always to grid one, and we know the grid nomenclature is usually on the, the backing of the gauge so that you don't have confusion about that. Uh, the mathematical gymnastics you have to put it into, if you didn't put the grids in the right order, the information would be erroneous. These are the different gauge types I kind of mentioned this earlier, but the gauge that's in the upper left, that's the 060WR. That was the traditional gauge that was used for printed circuit board testing 20 years ago. Uh, this is a standard uh, three element stacked rosette. It consists of an epoxy phenolic backing and encapsulation. And uh, typically at this time, it would have these beryllium copper lead ribbons that would extend out. 
So we found customers were, in some cases, splicing to these, and in other cases, they would make a board that would have some vias that these leads would feed right down into, and they would uh, complete the solder connection. In general, though, we found that the labor content was higher than what they wanted, and that was really what started driving the development of the 062 WW, the 031 WW, as well as the G1350 and some of the other patterns as well. And JDEC 9704 calls out using stacked rosettes of one to two millimeter grids. And you're trying to keep that gauge length as small as possible. Uh, and the reason for that is that you've got a lot of non-uniform strain on the board. You've got it populated with components uh, that creates very localized stress concentrations. Uh, so in general, you select very small size gauges like the G1350 to minimize that averaging of the strain gauge. In fact, as I recall, the G1350 was designed around the 9704A spec or, or guideline. I believe you're right. So as Jim mentioned before, the S5198 is a planar style, very small three element rosette using the advanced sensors uh, technology that allows us to make gauges smaller and higher in resistance than we've ever been able to before. And the advantages of the S5198 is that it is a planar style, so you have area for each grid to dissipate heat into the material so it helps to reduce the effects of self-heating and um, also it minimizes the error or uncertainty you'd have associated with a stacked gauge on a thin member uh, in bending. And they've made it small enough so that it's easily uh, positioned in a way that doesn't go over the vias or in a location where they have to remove a component. Again, you start removing components and you change the strain field and the strain, the strain field, once it's changed, your data is less meaningful than it would be with all uh, components populated. Now, this talks about gauge location and in general we try and avoid telling you where to put the strain gauge but there have been guidelines in the uh, JDEC standards that tell you where you should and where you should not and how it should be oriented and that sort of thing. Uh, whatever the standard is, if you follow those dimensional uh, guidelines, then comparing your data to the data that your supplier is supplying to you or that sort of thing, uh, you can correlate the two of those quite well. Uh, it's important that uh, when you're looking like, say, a ball grid array, that you try and look at all four corners to get you an idea of whether it's a uniformly stressed ball grid array or whether there's stress concentrations at any one point around the edge. And while we have seen some customers bond strain gauges on top of the components, the preferred technique is to put the strain gauge at the corner on the printed circuit assembly, not on the actual uh, component. And there's been considerable effort also to determine the validity of installing the strain gauge on the back side of the board near uh, the opposite side of the component. Um, and it's really specific to customer requirements, but I've, I've run across that in many cases where they gauge both sides of the board and compare the, the data one side to the other, the component side versus the reverse side. And this is a really good sketch kind of showing the distance the gauge should be away from the corner of the component. Uh, a lot of testing, thinking back 20 years ago when this was really getting started, there was a lot of effort put into establishing how close should the gate be to the edge of the component because obviously as you work your way away from that, you start to change that strain field. <coughs> Some of the installation methods, uh, the preferred method would be to uh, minimize the material that you remove. So a fiberglass pen, pen can be used to a, kind of ablate the surface. Uh, if there's uh, no uh, circuit board tracks that are underneath the gauge, 
Uh, you could use 400 grit silicon carbide abrasive paper to help uh, get rid of some of those surface undulations. In general, we recommend the uh, GC6 or it's a reagent grade of isopropyl alcohol. Uh, Water-based uh, cleaners should be uh, avoided and or if they are used, be sure that they're driven off before the gauge is, is uh, installed. For instance, with the conditioner A, the neutralizer, uh, you might have to be concerned about uh, its compatibility with copper. Uh, the neutralizer 5A is a Bo-Peep ammonia solution and it would, might react badly with the copper. So in some cases, it, uh, you, you basically use the GC6 you get the surface roughness where you need it with wet, uh, wet abrading with the GC6 and then bond with the, typically the M-Bond 200 is ideal because it's a one minute thumb pressure and two minutes under the tape and you're ready to test. Uh, in some cases the AE-10 uh, can be used and would possibly be preferred. However, it has uh, clamping pressure associated with it and a minimum cure time of six hours at room temperature. So. It sometimes is required because of the temperature rating of the test or some other parameters of the test. Uh, lead wire routing uh, should be done such that if it's being used in a bed of nails test or typical like that, that you're not going to have any uh, interference with the test probes that again would change the test uh, by the fact that they were interfering. Uh, the SP20 option is probably a good idea if you're trying to worry about uh, avoiding where those test probes are going to hit your part. You know, uh, one one question I think comes up sometimes with printed circuit, and it may be more of an opinion as to, as to the correct answer, but what about conformal coatings? What's our consensus on opinion here? If you have a, a board that has a conformal coating on it, uh, should that coating be removed or left in place? I would say yes, the conformal coating would probably have to be removed because it's more of an elastomer and it won't transmit the strain faithfully into the strain gauge. That circuit board may have quite a bit of stress on it, but by the time it makes it through that conformal coating, it's being attenuated by that coating. So I would say the general recommendation would be to remove it uh, in the area of interest and or don't use it in, in general in the first place. However, if, if the conformal coating is part of the, the final assembly, you might run a test without the conformal coating, then coat it with the gauge installed and see what difference that makes in your strains. So with that in mind, I think when we talk about minimal surface removal, we're talking about uh, the materials that would add structural strength to the board, something that's going to transfer strain to the component. Right. Yeah. You want to keep it as real as is possible, the real test with the real coatings and that sort of thing, but you're also concerned about strain transmission. One of the things we did find through experimentation is that the typical solder mass that's used on FR4 uh, it actually does a very good job of transmitting strain. We did some extensive comparative testing early on because our original position was we had to remove that solder mask and get down to the FR4 but we found that we we're actually doing more, more harm than good and the solder mass actually was a very good medium for transmitting strain. And it's different. The, the, standard, uh, the standard practice now is to just uh, remove enough of the material to get a matte finish mm -hmm. so you get some mechanical tooth for the adhesive to lock into and not try to remove that all the way down to the, the FR4. Right. I think that's an excellent point. You want some texture and if you look at the board and you can see that it's reflecting light and it's shiny, you know you continue to need to uh, create that texture and 400 grit paper has been my experience, works great, uh, maybe even cross hatching it, but you want it to be dull. Dull is indicating that you got more surface texture for the adhesive uh, to bite to it and that's what you're chasing after. Got to give its claws something to grab hold of. Uh, data collection. Uh, one of the things that you have to uh, think about with this type of testing is that oftentimes you have stacked rosettes and you're gluing them down on the materials that are not necessarily a good heat sink like a piece of aluminum or steel would be. So what that really means is that you've got to watch what level of voltage you use to power the circuit. And in general, uh, two volts is typically safe uh, in some cases, you may have to drop down to maybe one volt. So be mindful of that as you start to take the strain gauge and connect it to your data acquisition that you need to be using a lower level excitation, maybe one to two volts. 
Um, as we've kind of talked about before with scanning rates, the scan rate really depends on the type of testing you're doing, whether it's kind of an in-circuit tester where it's like a, a essentially would, would be a, for the most part, a static condition, or you were doing a drop test. And in general, it can be, the sampling rates can be all across the board. Uh, 100 samples a second would be very typical for like an in-circuit tester or or maybe adding a component onto the board or maybe even depaneling the board where when you start getting into drop testing that's where you need to typically be around 20,000 samples a second or maybe even higher. It's also really important that you get simultaneous sampling. Uh, the data acquisition system must be synchronized so that all three channels of the rosette the data is taken at exactly the same time so that you can use those to compare to one another and the mathematics will work. Also, one thing about the low excitation, one way to tell that you uh, have a problem is if the gauge is unstable at zero, something we call grid self-heating. When you turn on the excitation, if it starts to wander around, there's a good possibility that you've got grid self-heating going on and you need to reduce that until it remains stable at zero. That's a very good point, Tom. And you know, Micromeasurements has introduced these new products that we talked about a few slides back. The G1350 just recently is available in 350 ohms. So this allows you, this addresses a very important uh, problem with printed circuit board testing, I think, is that users are now able to use successfully higher excitation voltage, get a higher signal to noise ratio. This is also addressed in the advanced sensors that we discussed, the S5145, the S5198. Those offer very, very tiny uh, patterns, uh, all available in 350 ohms, so that users can avoid that uh, problem with excitation. Good point. You can thank our German office for the, the 350 ohm version of the G1350. They uh, uh, had a customer who demanded it, and we said, why not? We'll build it. So some of the common uh, calculations that are made uh, if you're using three element rosettes, uh, very common to take the data, uh, crunch the numbers, and calculate the principal strains and direction. Uh, if you're using a strain smart system or one of the Pacific instrument systems, the PI 660 uh, software, uh, that will do that calculation for you. Uh, another common strain that customers in this field are chasing after is the diagonal strain. And with our software, you can either create a user-defined assignment to calculate it, uh, or you could also take the data and export it into a spreadsheet such as Excel and use that to calculate it. We're working on currently a, a new version of StrainSmart that will have the strain rate algorithms in, in, on board as a standard feature. System 7000 and our soon-to-be-released 7100 um, are commonly used for monotonic bend tests and assembly uh, load testing with sampling rates up to 2,000 samples per second per channel and the ability to have very, very high channel counts uh, in, in the way of hundreds of channels in a single integrated synchronized system. Um, not fast enough for the shock and drop testing but for the vast majority of the standardized tests, again, in assembly, monotonic band, bed of nails testing, in most cases that sampling rate is adequate. And if you're looking at a system 8000, uh, it's limited to, to 1,000 samples per second, but it's a very portable, small, simple to set up, and any one channel can be set up to be measured as a strain gauge or Wheatstone bridge-based input, a thermocouple, or a high-level input. So. If you're looking at a, a short-term test where uh, convenience of setup and that sort of thing and flexibility of the instrument, System 8000 fits that bill. But because of the thousand samples per second, it is definitely not something for any kind of dynamic testing. You're looking at about a hundred hertz frequency response from it. One of the nice things, Tom, about the System 8000, its compact size coupled with the fact that it is DC powered it can be run off of a vehicle battery and will easily move down a production line without having to be tethered to an AC power outlet somewhere. So it just lends itself to high portability and use in a manufacturing setting. Uh, it's about the size of a laptop computer, uh, so it makes it very easy to handle and again move down through, down through a production assembly area 
without having to be tethered to uh, to a wall outlet for power. The portability is something I like because I can throw that thing in my book bag with my laptop computer, go to a customer's site, help them with strain data, and, and carry it back on the airplane with me. No big deal. Another thing to point out about it too is that it supports the VCAL card, which is uh, the calibration card we use to essentially calibrate the scanner. So you can purchase that as an option and essentially calibrate your box as often as you want. You don't have to send it out to be calibrated. You can do that yourself. And the VCAL card itself, you can send that to us to have it calibrated, have it be traceable. And what I would probably recommend if you have a large number of systems is have two cards. One that you have in using, setting your calibrations in, in the field, and the other in here for calibration, and that way you're never down in terms of traceable calibration. System 9000 is our latest uh, data acquisition system. Um, it was really targeted for the drop testing market. Um, sample rates are up to 50,000 samples per second, and that's all simultaneous uh, sampling. Um, on this image, you can see the Ethernet ports. We have inputs for uh, 12 channels per box, plus an additional four open slots that you could plug in either an accelerometer card, a uh, high-level card, or a thermocouple card into those uh, slots. Uh, it also supports the Strain Smart software, so it's very simple to set up and get it up and running. And if you want to, you can synchronize up to three of these systems together for a maximum of uh, 36 channels. And mentioning the Strain Smart software, that's uh, something we really uh, like to provoke, promote. It's uh, something that allows you to do all the circuit refinements and, and verification and linearity corrections, all of that stuff. It has the equivalent of about a hundred years worth of, of technical experience for micro measurements in it. And if you don't know anything about strain measurement, it's intuitively obvious how it works. It allows you to do thermal output correction, uh, Wheatstone Bridge nonlinearity correction. Uh, the rosette calculations are all done for you inside. Uh, there's a number of features that it uh, allows you to do. And another thing is it's a site license. If you purchase this software, and let's say you have a, a particular site uh, that your, all your employees are at, every single computer at that particular site can have StrainSmart installed on it. So you can take the data in one location and then take it off and analyze it in another, and uh, the site license will uh, allow you to do that. Further, uh, if we make an update to improve any features of the StrainSmart software, you pay for it one time. Up upgrades after that are free. Pacific Instruments, which was a recent uh, add to the VPG family, uh, really takes over in, in the uh, data acquisition arena where, where micro-measurements instrumentation stops. When we get into extremely high record rates and very, very high channel count, uh, Pacific Instruments really excels. Uh, their cost per channel is very, very competitive, and the capabilities are, are by far and away uh, industry leading. So if there's something in the MM portfolio that doesn't meet the, the end user requirement, Pacific Instruments takes <coughs> over from that point and can support uh, tens of thousands of channels at extremely high scan rates up to, to uh, 200,000 samples per second per channel and again all fully synchronized. It's worth noting the input types there. You've got strain gauge, thermocouple, high level voltage, piezoelectric, RTDs, 4 to 20 milliamp circuits, digital ISO and DSP outputs. Uh, these allow that system to be very flexible in terms of what it can take in and how it can send it back out. If you're looking to learn more about uh, strain gauge applications in general or on printed circuit board assemblies, we have workshops that we teach on a regular basis on strain gauge installation. Uh, typically, we have a two-day, a three-day, and a five-day class. And over the past few years, we've been adding 
uh, more topics associated with testing, printed circuit board assemblies or plastics and composites. Um, we teach those here in Raleigh, uh, or we also teach those out on the road. Uh, and we could even come to your site if you wanted to have us visit your facility and teach a one-day or two-day class or even a three-day class, uh, we can do that. And that, that particular uh, class or workshop can be customized to fit your specific needs if there's something unusual that you'd like to learn, and we're capable of teaching it, of course. And one thing we like to talk about at Micro Measurements, we're one-stop shopping. You can get your strain gauges, the installation accessories, the environmental protection, the instrumentation, we can provide you with hands-on training, and we've got uh, the app engineering staff and the technical sales managers who are, I uh, hate to use the word experts, but uh, experts, uh, X is a has-been, spurt is a drip under pressure, but they're expert in strain measurements and it's free. All you have to do is give us a call, send us an email, whatever uh, method of communication you prefer, and we will treat your uh, technical request uh, and get those uh, answered as quickly as is practical. Okay, thanks everyone for attending the webinar today. We'll now open the floor, open the uh, call for discussions. Please join us. Give us a call. You got any questions? We got answers.